This podcast is brought to you by Bonus Room Productions and We Own This Town. I am Jason T. Mears, Esquire. And I'm Kelly Hoyle Bullock. And we are San Dimas Today. How's it going, Kelly? JT, we've come far. We've come very far. We've come very far. We're we're down to the brass tacks here, man. We've got like one more official entry and then an additional unofficial entry. And then I don't know what we do with ourselves. Yeah. You know, we're going to have to come up with something else to talk about. And I know how hard that is for you and I. It is. It's, it's really hard. I mean, when we're on the phone every night, we just sit there in silence, but we're <laughs> on the true. phone together. So, but before we start on fast eight, one thing, um, there are rumblings and rumors in the Twitter sphere caused by Mr. Alex Winter that maybe Face the Music might be changing its release strategy or that it might get, get changed again. Now, of course, we live in a day and age where everything's up in the air, but uh, Alex Winter did tweet that um, everybody on Face the Music was committed to releasing the film safely and they are updating. Uh, what they're going to do as they go and as more news comes in. So we should probably be on the lookout for a change here in the next week or two. Uh, I don't know if that's going to be a change in the release date or if they're going to look at, you know, digital download type release strategy. We'll we'll find out. But it it looks like there could be another change coming. I've been wondering how, you know, just in the last couple of weeks with some movies that have uh, that have come out during these COVID times, uh, whatever you want to call it. The King of Staten Island, Judd Apatow's most recent movie, uh, mm-hmm. it did it did a release straight to video, but with a, a pretty high price, at least for the first, I, I forgot what he said, first month or two, of like the 1999, you know, and I'm, I'm yeah. really wondering how that's doing, what those, what those sales have been like. Uh, yeah, that is interesting, because I know other films have done that too, and um, uh, okay, so obviously the, the biggest movie of the summer, Scoob. Um, the animated origin tale of Scooby Doo, um, and I only know this because my daughter, for some reason, is it bigger it, than the Trolls I, movie? I'm, I'm being sarcastic. The Trolls World Tour has <laughs> lit the world on fire. But uh, <laughs> Scoob was available to rent for twenty bucks, and then it was a no. It was available to rent for fifteen dollars, and then two weeks later, it was available to buy for twenty bucks. So. I think these things are just moving targets. I know uh, A24 and some of the smaller, more independent companies have been doing $20 releases of some of the festival favorites. And after that, they're kind of getting to Amazon and stuff. It's it. it, Who knows? Who knows, man? I'm I'll say right now, I would pay $20 to rent face the music and watch it from my home. I would pay that. I think um, we I think we would pay a lot more than that, but uh. we probably would <laughs> at this point. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I think if it's a movie you're really into and you get it for your entire house, like twenty bucks for my wife and I to watch a, a new release, that's a steal. You know, we're gonna spend way more than that if we try and go out to the theater. So if I can spend twenty bucks and watch it from my house, I'll be okay with that. I'd rather see it in the theater, but I don't want to, you know, catch a virus and die doing so. Agreed, sir. Agreed. And yeah, it's, you know, another sad part of this whole thing is, uh, you know, you always hear that the movie theaters mostly make their money off of the concessions because they're having to pay such high, you know, licensing fees and, and a lot of money to the studios just, just to, just to have the movie to show. And, um, I, I, I'd like to be, you know, cautiously optimistic, but man, it just, it doesn't look good for movie theaters out there. No, and it, things don't look good for, you know, maybe there are parts of the country where, where it's looking better, but you and I are both in Tennessee and we are just spiking and it's July. You know, it, I don't see things turning around and being safe in eight weeks, honestly. Well, hey, on that note, let's talk about yeah! Fate of the Furious. <laughs> Fate of the Furious. <laughs> eight movies, dude. Eight movies. Here we are. Eight movies. How do you feel? How do you feel? Eight in. You know, eight in, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. You know, I enjoyed this movie a lot more than maybe I even thought I would uh, in, in terms of it keeping my attention for two and a half hours, whatever the runtime was. Um, mm-hmm. That and, you know, right off the bat, uh, just wanted to mention yet another director. We had F. Gary Gray on this one. Um, still the same writer, Chris Morgan. But uh, I thought that was interesting. You know, F. Gary Gray, uh, he made his name directing Friday. Wow, I did not realize yeah. that. Wow. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm honestly surprised Ice Cube didn't pop up in this movie. 
<laughs> Maybe he was a stormtrooper or something. I don't know. Yeah. And, and plus, how are you going to get Ice Cube in there when you've got half the cast of Game of Thrones, you know, in here? <laughs> Good point. Good point. Yeah. <laughs> um, man, so like this one for me, oh, well, we're talking about the director. Did you notice that he kept the previous director's little visual flair of blocking the camera onto a character's orientation during a fight and spinning around? That's true. That's a good point. I did. I did notice that. That's kind of neat. So, I mean, they're, yeah. they're built on themselves, but, uh, I have to say I love Charlize Theron, but I did not really care for Cypher as a villain. Let's start off with the name Cypher as a villain. Okay. Yeah. It sucks. It's, <laughs> it's awful. It's pretty terrible. It, <laughs> I mean, like, it's just so almost cliche. I don't know. Like, oh, she's yeah. a hacker and her name's Cypher. I've I seen that know, movie man. before. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> like, my, my email address, my Gmail address is is from when, my early 20s. And I've kept it, I guess. So maybe, like, she was in her, like, late teens, early 20s. And she's like, okay, I'm good. And she thought it just sounded really cool. And then she just got kind of tied to it. Like, like I, she didn't want to correct people. Yeah, I used to be Cypher, but my name's <laughs> actually Elizabeth. So if you could just call me Elizabeth, I'd appreciate it. Maybe she's just leaning into the ridiculousness of it. But um, I, I'm envisioning a scenario where Charlize Theron is, is actually reading the script for the first time. And she's like, Cypher, you got to be fucking kidding me. <laughs> and then she gets told how much she's being paid to be in the movie. And it's like, okay, she's like, cool. She's like, okay, white dreadlocks. Then I guess, yeah, doing white dreadlocks too. <laughs> And speaking of, I, I was real interested to see that this movie at the time had the biggest all-time opening ever. Uh, yeah. It was it was outdone by the first Infinity War movie the next year, but uh, wow, incredible. This movie, despite the, the awful villain, um, which, you know, speaking of Marvel movies, most of them also have terrible villains too, right? That's like an ongoing Marvel problem. But despite that here, I think like the action sequences in, in this were one insane and two a lot of fun i mean the the zombie car thing yeah i could take or leave um but it was neat to see that chaos on new york city streets right yeah yeah shooting any movie in new york city uh is such a monumental task you can probably find great stories uh of any movie that's had to been shot there especially if they include Times square you know mm -hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> speaking of shooting difficult action sequences did want to uh bring up the fact um you and i have both talked about it since but uh in our discussion of the last movie the furious seven uh we completely did not address two of like the biggest action sequences ever made and uh just you know apologizing to our listeners there, but you know, we, we really wanted to dig in on some other finer points. I think that's yeah, probably you know, why like, yeah. I don't think people who are still listening to us, this bill and Ted podcast talking about the fast and the furious. I don't think they're really <laughs> looking to us to describe what happened on screen in detail. So I think we get a pass, but it was, it was a definitely glaring oversight on our part and uh, apologies, dear listeners. We we're sorry. That that said, I do want to mention that uh, the Dubai scene where they're driving the cars through the building and jumping into the next building uh, was fantastic, and oh, it definitely so my my vertigo <laughs> was in full effect. Full oh, effect. Boy. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. That that one was so fun. That one was yeah. so fun. That was. Great. And then uh, I thought Tyrese's comedic performance uh, in his unwillingness to parachute in a car out of the whatever it was, giant plane, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. That was pretty funny too. Yeah, and, uh, and then the callback to that in, in Fate of the Furious was pretty nice. It was great. It was, it was really well done. <laughs> uh, Tyrese really has won me over on these movies the second time around. The first time around, I was kind of, eh, he's there, fine, whatever. But he's, he's an important part of the family. So with, with, with this new movie, you know, you've got the setup, you've got your villain cypher. Gosh, I just can't even say that without laughing. <laughs> just, we'll just say Charlize for the rest yeah. of this okay. episode. Right. I definitely like the idea of having to turn Dominic rogue. I thought that was like solid idea right there. Execution of it. Clunky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. You know, obviously the motivation being the baby he didn't know about, which that didn't really bother me as much, but I just really hate that Elena has never been fleshed out at all. And then they just offed her, you know? Yeah. So. I mean, she totally got fridged and that was terrible. I mean, like she, she was solid actress, did good work, never given much to do except 
fall in love with Dom and then accept that Dom was still in love with Letty. And total bummer. But the thing with the baby and my favorite scene in any of these movies ever is the end of this one with uh, Shaw and the baby doing the lone wolf and cub thing. Um, I just, I love that so much. That's the best thing that they have ever done for my money. Just so good. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was far and above the big scene for this movie. You know, I, I found, you know, some interesting comments online. Uh, I sort of did a little internet research because so much was made around, you know, certain members of the cast, not getting along while they were shooting this and did find it interesting that Michelle Rodriguez definitely called out, the lack of depth for any of the female roles and basically saying she was not going to be in another movie if they didn't do any better. So maybe that that's something to look for, uh, in F nine, you know, uh, maybe, but I think spoiler alert that might be getting addressed by another spinoff. That's going to be the, um, basically females of fast and the furious. They're going to have their own film. Oh yeah. You, you had mentioned that. Uh, and that's, I haven't seen a whole lot about that, so I didn't know if that was definitely happening or not. My understanding is it's still happening. Of course, everything's on pause now, um, yeah. so we'll see. I also think there might be another Hobbs and Shaw sequel that's in the works. So, you know, you've got the expanded universe. But I, I think the way that they're really dealing with that, and hopefully they'll get more uh, fleshed out in the actual main series. But I, I think the main thing that got her back on board for Fast 9 was the, the spinoff. All right. So moving along here, um, of course, you know, the biggest thing that made me feel the best in this movie was the return of Mr. Nobody. Uh, yep. You just can't go wrong with Kurt Russell and definitely love the addition of his protege, Little Nobody, played by mm-hmm. Clint Eastwood's son, Scott. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. Anytime you can get Kurt Russell back in these movies, it, it's a it's a great day. That was a lot of fun. Always good seeing him. I, I love the prison break. I love the prison break. That was so much fun. Yep. The prison ba- break scene is my second favorite scene in the movie um, mm-hmm. with number one being the uh, soccer scene at the beginning of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, we talked about this on the last one, like making the rock a dad is just yeah. a great choice for that character. Great mm-hmm. choice for that character. Love it to death. Love it mm-hmm. to death. Yeah. And uh, it was, it was really neat The you know, I, I can't help but think it was probably, Dwayne Johnson's idea to do the entire Samoan war dance with, with the soccer team. Uh, that was just, yeah. that was just a great dose of comedy right there. That that was fantastic. Um, how did you feel about the submarine? You know, I mean, it was, it was, the submarine was fine, I guess. Uh, you know, it, it, it seemed like they just brought it in because, Hey, what haven't we done yet? What, what ground have we not covered in an action movie? We need right. a, we need a submarine. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I kind of, kind of got that feeling too. It's like, okay, well let's, let's see. We did a giant plane. You know, we've done cars, we've done cars into helicopters. Let's, let's get a nuclear submarine and do that. <laughs> just, just odd, just odd. Um, I love Helen Mirren's return. That was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, uncredited cameo is what they say. Oh, nice. Nice. That was interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, the biggest thing missing from this movie, you probably realized it, or maybe you didn't even realize it, but this, one thing that has been featured heavily in all of these films, Corona. Ooh, you're right. There There's is no, no Corona. Corona. There's no Corona in this movie. You know, maybe he's switched to Belgian ale for good now. <laughs> probably. That's probably what happened. Yeah. yeah. It, it Also, I, I got to say, it felt really weird in this movie. Like, I definitely felt Paul Walker's absence. That was something I was thinking about. Maybe his role uh, got diminished, you know, over the years. Uh, maybe he was outclassed by other actors. But I think you've been right this whole time. He really is that thread that kind of ties it all together. Uh, keeps that family aspect in there. And one might say that not having him on the set... Uh, did the same thing, you know, with every, with all the actors. Oh man. Um, I think you're, I think you're right on there. I think you were right on there. I hadn't even considered the, the behind the scenes. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, I mean, it seems to me with everything I've been reading, it's like we, we basically have Hobbs and Shaw. So Dwayne Johnson can be in this series and not have to act with Vin Diesel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, did they even have a, a, more than a scene together in this movie? No, they didn't. Yeah. It was just like one and it was like a phone conversation, wasn't it? Like, yeah. So weird. I don't, I, you know, I understand like Hollywood has outsized personalities and stuff, but 
if I'm getting paid that much money to do a thing, I'm probably just going to shut up and smile, but who knows? <laughs> who knows? It was a nice touch, uh, Dom naming his son, Brian, you know, it was, saw that coming obviously, but still. Sure. Yeah. I mean, what a, what a weird narrative thing. Like I felt like the father should give him a first name, even though I never told the father that he had a son. So my kid's only been rocking a middle name for several she, months now. I'm holding off on filling out that birth certificate until I find the time to tell my son's father that he has a son that he needs to give a name to. Uh, she really, and honestly, she, she probably could have just written in Brian anyway, right? Right, right. She knew where that was going. I was glad she thought it all through before she got executed. All, all I'm saying, parents, is name, name your children fully before you're abducted and held prisoner on a plane. Because you never know what's going to happen after that. Uh, Natalie Emanuel, pretty sidelined in this one. Yep. She basically got relegated to other hacker and uh, love triangle, you know. Yeah. IG. She was also fully in, you know, fully into Game of Thrones at this point. This was like, they shot this in 2017 or 2016, yeah, 2017. Point. That is a yeah. fair point. But it, always, always uh, happy to see her on screen. I think she does a great job with what she's given um, kind of, you know, stepping into the Gal Gadot role of being the lady in the room that's pretty much smarter than all the guys. Uh, so I appreciate that. Um, no secret weddings in this one. Just a just a unknown a secret baby. baby. <laughs> yeah, just a secret <laughs> baby. Um, yeah. A note on casting for this movie that I found out because you know we had the brief appearance of our boy Lucas Black in the last one. Yeah. So he was going to shoot in this one, but he had scheduling conflicts due to NCIS New Orleans. Mm. Um, and of course, we talked about how he's going to be in the next one mm -hmm. and has left NCIS New Orleans. So yep. uh, looking for hopefully a nice big meaty role for him. I feel like that would help maybe get a little bit of what we're missing with Paul Walker, you know, but of course in that, uh, you know, how did, how did our friend Jasmine put it in that Gallatin High School kind of a way? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, 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 that's so interesting that he was brought in as a replacement initially, and now he's going to be brought back in to, to bring in some of that flair again. Just so interesting, so interesting. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing him. Uh, you know, it, it'll it'll be good to have him back. I have to talk to you about my biggest beef with the entire franchise, which is also in this movie. And I, a lot of people complain about this, and I want to get your thoughts. All right, Shaw killed Han, right? Just Stone Cold murdered Han. Yep. Part of the family. Just murdered him. Just awful, awful dude. Shaw's in the family now. He's like, okay, cool. We're you're you're one of us. You know? Yeah. Like well he, he he and the rock have like one good heart to heart. And then, you know, he helps rescue his Dom's baby and all's forgiven. <laughs> you're not the only one that that had a beef with that. Uh I was reading an old review by Richard Roper, and he's just like Hey, you know, they're like killing each other and then laughing about it five minutes later. Um, I predict this. I predict that Han is not dead and that's how they're going to write their way out of that one. Okay. All right. Okay. Man, I'd love to see Han back. That's the only kidding. thing I can think of, you know? Can you envision being in theaters? Because I, I, by the point that this one came out, I was like seeing them in theaters. And I went opening night. I was there with my, my uh, ride or die family in Chicago. We watched this movie and all of us were like, that was great. But how the hell do you like square Han's death? It, it, it's baffling. So I think you're probably right it, it, with the, the history and what we know about this franchise and especially Han being dead or not and altering timelines. And also isn't Justin Lin coming back to direct the next one? He is. And, and I think, I think it's already out there that Han's going to be in it some way or another. Right. With Justin Lin coming back for the next one, it would make sense for Han to come back for the next one, which would be fantastic because, you know, I love my Han. He's 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 the home crowd favorite, you know? Mm -hmm. He is. He is. Something that definitely didn't stick out to me at all in this movie was the music. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember any of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, that, that's absolutely true. And it, it seems like these movies have excuse the pun, drifted a little bit into just normal blockbuster territory and less of a, I don't know, stylized type thing. Like you, you lose little flourishes like the music or Corona or things like that. Like 
the touchstones of these movies that are so important, I feel like this one started to shed some of that. You know, another, another good spot that I really enjoyed too with this film was the opening scene in Cuba. Yeah. Um, yep. that race. Mm-hmm. And I even found something where, uh, there was, there's actually a professor cited for, uh, commenting on the political significance of that opening scene in the context of U S and Cuban relations. Right. Because you have, you have the whole, uh, you know, one guy wins the other guy's respect, that type of thing. Um, but nice. I, I thought that was great. That was like, that was just a nice throwback um, to the original feel, you know? Yeah, it was. Like, it started out with a, a, a unique race, but also what it did was it allowed Dom to show his philosophy with other people, which does actually, now that I'm thinking about it, tie in with Shaw and, you know, like changing his heart, you know? A lot, lot of forgiveness in old Vin Diesel, this unless you're Dwayne one. Johnson. <laughs> right. right. Yeah, that, that's that's the one bridge it's too far, I guess. Well, man, uh, what do you think is going to happen in Hobbs and Shaw? What do you know about Hobbs and Shaw? What do you think is going to happen? I, you know, I know nothing about it. Um, don't know any of the cast. Nothing on the storyline. Uh, just know that Jason Statham and Dwayne Johnson will be in it. Um, and I feel like you've got all kinds of possibilities there. You know, I don't know how much it's really going to tie into the, you know, thread of, of, of the main sort of storylines for everyone, but it seems like you could give them just about any adventure, uh, or set of hijinks to get into. I, I would love for like Mr. Nobody to be the guy, like sending them out on whatever they're going to do in this film. Uh, mm-hmm. cause I'd love to keep around Kurt Russell. That's for sure. Yeah. But, you know, I'm just excited. Uh, I'm glad that I'm kind of going in blind. Um, oh, I know man. I know it was pretty well received. So it, uh, it, It's a lot of fun. It, it, it really has a lot of, and I, and I mean this in the best way possible, it has a lot of good Michael Bay qualities to it. There's some Bay I can get behind. You know this. I, I know. I, there's some Bay I can get behind, too. I, I said I meant it in a good way. Like, there, there's <laughs> the positive, positive connotations for that, all that I meant. So not like lens flares and helicopters. <laughs> Gosh, I, I just, I think about when Michael Bay came onto the scene in the nineties and it was, I was just like, Oh, they did it. They made a, a video from MTV, an entire movie. Yep. And, and you know, there is a place for that. There is a place for that action movie. Dude. I, I owned VHS copies of both the rock and con air. And I wore those things out. You know, I did like they, they were <laughs> on repeat for a couple summers because that was, they're just so much fun. Well, does that about do us for for Fate Eight? <laughs> I think <laughs> that's I think. my nickname for it now. Fate Eight. So, as always, we continually thank Michael Leeds for getting our voices to your ears, and Scott Brickland and Scooby Tunes Music for the use of the most excellent song "Walk Away." Uh, much appreciated. And JT, keep on being excellent to each other, and you know, party on. Dudes. Hello, sir. Yeah, pour one out for Charlie Daniels yet? Oh, did he die too? He did. Well, I'm sorry that Ennio Morricone had to die on the same day as Charlie Daniels. I know. I know. Fucking tragic. Oh, man.